Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Carrie, and I'm M Plus's Curator of Learning and Interpretation, and I'm happy to welcome you here this evening. M, M Plus will open to the public next year, and so in the lead up to our opening, we'll be offering a range of online and hopefully in-person programs while we count down to our launch. Today, we're bringing to you the first in a series of talks with our curators as they introduce pairs of objects in the M Plus collection. So the Canadian Centre for Architecture in Montreal has challenged us to try out one of their recipes for public programs. We chose the recipe, how did you two meet? The recipe kind of goes like this. Pick the oldest object in the collection and then pick the newest object in the collection. Then we have the curator introduce the two objects and narrate a story that connects the two. So today we are diving into the world of the design and architecture collection. First up is our lead curator, Iko Yokoyama, who will introduce you to two objects from the design collection. Once Iko has finished, we'll hear from Shirley Surya, who will introduce us to two objects from the architecture collection. They each have no more than 10 minutes, and then we'll leave 10 minutes at the end for questions from all of you. Please feel free to type them into the chat window during the talk, and we'll um, make sure we ask them to our presenters. Those of you who want closed captioning, look for the CC button on your screens, and that way you can see the text typed into your screens. So let's get started. Eco. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, so, let me there. So, we've, so I will talk about the two objects tonight, but before I go into that, I will quickly tell you about the what is it, uh, what we have a design architecture collection at the M plus. So today we have about 2400 works in a plus collection, which is like a typically furniture, industrial object and the graphic design, architecture models and some craft uh, objects. And then we also have about 37,000 archival material, which is, um, yeah, majority of it is architecture drawing, but it's also including sketches, photographies and the correspondence so on. And then we have been collecting this uh, collection since 2013. So let's see, can you get the picture? Yes. So the first object I will talk about is a very rare kimono. It's known as propaganda kimono, which has been a popular between the end of 1800 uh, to the end of Second World War. It is a lesser known or rather uh, unspoken fashion phenomenon, except among the researchers and the specialists who is examining the development propaganda material. Uh, this kimono for men uh, was made around 1895, so this is the oldest object we have in a collection. And then also the oldest one, we have a few of them among the propaganda kimonos. Uh, this one is a particularly, uh, the, this uh, depict several, let's see, let's get the picture, the several, uh, the important scene uh, during the first Chino Japanese war. For example, the scene like assigning the treaty in Shimonoseki or the land army war, or even the neighbor battles probably took a place in Wei Highway, uh, northeast coast of China, where it became a least territory for the UK in 1898 to 1930. So you can see some kind of the very historical depiction. Uh, and this type of kimono is known as sensogara, it's world time patterns, but it's also, it's a sub so-called omoshirogara, it's a novelty mm -hmm. patterns. So these patterns were in fashion rather than recognized as a propaganda tools, as it was produced and distributed by commercial drapers to capture the trend. So motifs were, let's see picture, yes. So motifs are often taken from the news or Nishkiye. It's a type of colorful wood block print that was very popular at the time. And uh, Nishkiye print was widely used for the, by the publishers to illustrate uh, newsworthy topics such as fashion, technology, and the world-related news. The popularity of the visual uh, communication of the Nishkiye is uh, probably the reason why the design of this kimono also took a similar approach, almost like a journalistic one, uh, by including real headline events into the patterns. And then uh, the kimono was uh, made out of chili men silk. Chili men means like a crepe. It's very like a slightly crimped fabric. It's very soft silk. Uh, applied using dye technique, which is a traditional Japanese hand painted dye technique, as you can see in the picture. Uh, it's suitable to uh, depict very detailed and very meticulous patterns and using craftsmen often regarded as an artist, a highly skillful illustrator. 
So then next object, uh, it's called Pet Lamp. PetLamp is an ongoing project conceived by Spanish designer Alvaro Catalan de Ocon and his team since, uh, since 2012. Uh, it is started when Alvaro participated in the project investigating plastic waste issues in Colombia Amazonas with a focus on the conflict, uh, conflicting connotation of pet bottles. What I mean by that is uh, the drinking up to one bottle of pet, pet bottle drink is maybe take just one minute or even less but the one pet bottle to take almost a decade to decompose. And then also during that trip, uh, he has encountered a group of basket weavers from Cauca region uh, who used to live on the coast side, but they have been displaced to the other side of the Andes mountain due to the guerrilla war. So the Arvalo came up to the combine those two. The physically, if I dis describe what is pet lamp, is a lamp shade made out of used pet bottles and apply the different type of basket weaving. But the pet lamp is a not, it's not just a product, it's more like an anthropological project uh, through product making. So this is how it's made. So Alvaro was inspired from the structure of chasen, uh, you see on the picture on the right, it's a Japanese tea whisk made out of a single piece of bamboo. He saw he can kind of mimic, uh, create a similar structure uh, for using the pet bottle. So you use uh, the kind of neck as uh, the, the anchor point holding the lighting components and it's chopping off the bottom and then he shredded the side of the pet bottle. So then the, the shredded side uh, turned into warp. It's a warp is a terminology used for textile. It's a sled going the vertical. And then, uh, then you weaving in the natural fiber, usually for the basket weaving as a weft, the vertical strap to create, and then the craftsman to really weave along the, the shape for the, the lampshade. So as you see, it's a wooden mold you can see there in the picture. Um, then the successful, successful point of this project is the designer managed to balance the standardization of the products uh, for the global distribution to secure the steady income for the artisan, but at the same time made all the products unique. As you see in the picture, it's very amazing. The lady, she makes the lampshade almost as she dress. So he allowed to the each craftsman, so it's a standardized you know, mechanics and the shape but the old artisan can apply their own patterns and colors as they like, and that will be the different culture. For example, the first group of people, the Kauka people, they have weaved like the motifs of fish or waves to kind of commemorate their lost home. See the pictures, yes. So that's the also from Chile and uh, Africa. So the, the since the, the, the Alvaro's team has been continued to work on the pet lamps, almost one uh, pet lamp project each year in different countries. As you can, and then also they go to where the plastic waste is and the basket weaving. It's no doubt you can imagine pet bottle waste is everywhere in the world, but it's also the basket weaving is a relatively strong remaining craft in different tradition and different culture. So what uh, I said, so they have been doing in Chile, Ethiopia, Japan, Australia, Thailand, the latest one is Ghana. So the challenge is now to, now we can show, that was, to connect these two. That was my challenge today. So technically there's 127 years in between these two projects. And then it's not that often maybe you will see this together in the gallery, but this is a kind of the challenge. We try to make it the connection and um, and then at first I thought it was probably very difficult, but actually I found that, yeah, it's quite many sleds. Like A is a craft the to both, uh, the both project need a very highly skillful craftsman to conceive and then to using craft technique. And then also using a craft as to make a product for distribution. So it's a both a very commercial product. It's not just a one of just domestic use, it was a product. And also, of course, the aspect of weaving textile. But perhaps the most important or interesting one is this journalistic aspect. Like a pet lamp, as you understand, each pet lamp is almost like a reading the journal to understand what's happening in the world, uh, which, is, so, which is a kind of global story, but it's also the related specific stories. 
and the kimono also depicts very specific events in the history. But from there, so not only learning about what's happened during the wartime, but it's actually we can learn about the culture production, what's been going on during the wartime. So, so it, those kind of visual uh, cues are loaded in the both works. Uh, by decoding those works, it reveals the geopolitical circumstances of each time. So I will leave the clicker to Shelley. All right. Hello. Hello, hello. Good evening, all. Thank you for joining us after your dinner. Uh, I'm Shirley, uh, uh, design and architecture curator, and I'm to share two objects from the category of architecture, um, which you might find um, kind of, you know, like the second work may not sit very neatly in that category, but that's the point. Um, and so the first object uh, right now is what you see here. It's a drawing of uh, Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. Um, it's actually a drawing or a sectional drawing of a stonework of a rail of a, like a stairway um, by Frank Lloyd Wright. And so for those who would know the name of Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, you may understand why this work is in our collection. Uh, but uh, just to share that this uh, drawing was acquired it's not moving clicker yes there you go okay uh, together with these other five other drawings and, and as you can see here they're all kind of fragments <clears throat> fragments of a uh, very detailed design of the hotel itself everything from like the corner of uh, between a wall and a and the ceiling uh to do with like foyer of the fireplace, you know, all of that kind of detail. And uh, and this is basically, of course, the rest of the project archive of this uh, is, is, is with uh, the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation in, in Colombia. Uh, and so what we happen to be able to get are these six drawings. And I guess uh, the question here is why is it in the Amplas collections? And I just have to, to share that this is, of course, uh, largely because of the, oops, cannot click again, right? All right, largely because of the importance uh, of the project itself, which is the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. And this is a picture here uh, taken in 1960, around, yeah, before it was demolished in 1968. And you could imagine, you know, the massive scale and the kind of grand design, uh, how much of an instant landmark it was in Tokyo in the 20s or, or even 1920. And so at that point, uh, this project really spoke of, uh, of Japan's kind of like ambition for modernization and interna internationalization. And that's why even hiring the architect like Frank Lloyd Wright for this project really spoke of its cosmopolitan ambition. Uh, and so it is a kind of story about transnational and transcultural production uh, that M Plus is very interested in because such processes of designing uh, actually re requires um, a kind of a taking on a very different framework, or multiple frameworks, um, as well as, you know, of course, the idea of like what it means uh, to actually design in Asia for someone who is not from Asia and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, the, the other reason is, of course, the importance of Frank Lloyd Wright himself um, as a very influential architect. Uh, and so Frank Lloyd Wright uh, is just two houses, uh, one of his very famous houses, but it seems to one found before and after the Imperial Hotel. Um, and uh, he is actually known to have really completely transformed um, the development of modern architecture in, in the States in the, in, the turn of the in, the, in the turn of the 20th century, because uh, it was no longer about copying a particular kind of form uh, from Europe, you know, but it's really about designing uh, something that is really speaking to the place, to the site, to the materiality, and uh, and to the to the time. And so, and so that sets the the influence of Frank Lloyd Wright. And I think the question here is how he ended up uh, being able to design a project uh, in Tokyo. Uh, actually, went back to the fact that he himself is a collector of Japanese prints, uh, woodblock prints. In fact, the very first Hiroshige uh, exhibition was actually organized by him. And, uh, and some people have actually had this, you know, conjectures of like, oh, in what way does his composition have to be, you know, influenced by by Hiroshi, by, by the by these prints? And of course, it's just a question. But I think more importantly, um, more than just whether you know Japan influenced him in that sense, uh, he really has a has a very deep interest uh, in the city itself. And so, uh, and so uh, he already at that point um, visited Japan uh, even before this project. 
and as mentioned before, um, this project was highly important uh, for him, and it really transformed the scene not just in Japan but also for his career. And I guess I guess um, I have to bring up that this drawing um, again it really kind of signifies the idea of like a collaboration between Frank Lloyd Wright himself, but also with the local architects and craftsmen uh, in Japan. And so he is known to have produced a set of drawings in Chicago before he went to uh, Japan. But then when he went to Japan, he had to kind of change all of them. And this is largely because of the kind of a craftsmanship that he discovered uh, that he could actually be working with. Uh, and so a, a drawing such as the stairwell at the very right corner uh, is actually a poem there uh, in kanji. Uh, and so it's just like a little kind of notations, even if it's nothing to do with the, with the design itself, that shows that uh, the involvement of local draftsmen and architects in his project. And so it's really a collaborative thing. But of course, uh, another very key a uh, way in which the locality actually informs uh, Frank's uh, Wright's design is really the material that he chose to use to build the, the hotel. And he chose to use this thing called Oya stone, which is actually a mixture of lava and ash uh, that is particularly found in a quarry. Uh, it is a place called uh, Utsuno Mia. Yeah, and so uh, he actually managed to convince the hotel to actually buy this quarry in order to build these, uh, to extract these blocks uh, for the building itself. And so I think, uh, and so yeah, and so I think uh, another thing that's that's really important about this uh, Oya is actually fire resistant. And so this uh, quality of fire resistance is actually very important for, for Wright because he was already investigating on the nature of buildings in Tokyo, which often is prone to earthquake and all that. And so the idea of the porous stone is not only easy to carve because of his highly decorative ornamental design, uh, but these are also kind of uh, almost has a sense of being able to kind of like, you can say, absorb pressure. Uh, and so, so these seemingly very decorative drawings are actually part of a, you can say, I'm not saying it's a facade, but it's actually part of a larger uh, or structural system that is behind the facade that actually supports the building itself. And so I just want to show this last image here. Of course, the, that's the roof, the very famous roof that uh, that Wright actually designed. It's meant to be uh, earthquake resistant. And the other photo on the right corner is actually the, the fact that it was the only thing that stood uh, the earthquake, uh, Kanto earthquake of 1923. Everything else kind of fell apart. So it really raised uh, uh, Wright's fame uh, uh, on the world stage since this project uh, was completed. And the second project, uh, object or work, uh, which might complicate this category of architecture, is actually for those who are coming from Southeast Asia or Singapore, uh, you not even recognize this because it's actually a photo of a the beginnings of a land reclamation in Pulau Tekong. So Pulau Tekong happens to be an island for military exercise in Singapore, and it's taken by a Dutch photographer who is also an industrial designer and architect uh, trained. Um, yeah, so it's part of his investigative projects. And so before I go deeper into this photograph, I just want to be able to speak a little bit more about why these photographs are considered under architectural photography. Um, and so before, uh, and so a little bit on Bas. Um, so just another photo that we that happened to be in the collection that we acquired all at the same time at that as that photograph is this photograph. Okay, so it's an apart apartment, and then you see the grotto. And then you wonder, so which one came first, right? So either the cave came later or the apartment. And uh, and of course, um, the the name of the work here would give away the fact that it's actually in Jing'an, which is a very high-end residential neighborhood in Shanghai. Uh, so obviously, it is for high-end residents. And then the grotto was built together in a way that really blends uh, with with the architecture itself. So is this sort of like um, idea of the non-place? Uh, non-place here is actually a place of ambiguity. A spatial vagueness uh, that actually speaks of whether it's nature or man-made. It speaks of actually what are the forces that actually form this site, you know. So it's is that sort of questions um, that Bas Prince's photography actually reveal that made us uh, be very interested in his work. And another work here is um, okay. Oops, sorry. Stop. Right. This is a little bit of a lag there. So yeah, this is another photo. Uh, it's basically large mounds of, of sand uh, that is next to the Beijing Olympic site. Uh, and obviously these sand are meant to be used for the construction of the mega projects that are on site. Uh, again, so it is part of uh, Bas's interest in really revealing the kind of resources uh, that are used uh, to actually build our buildings and to actually construct our environments. And then the next one that I will go back to is of course, uh, this group of photographs, uh, it's actually part of uh, the photograph that I showed you just now of the hint of the island is actually part of a series called Hinterlands. So 
of course, the word hinterland here uh, is to do with the remote origins of, of resources uh, that are used uh, for a nation or a place uh, for, and, and of course, in this case, it's for the state. Uh, and so in these photographs, uh, Bas Prinson, as part of the Eteha uh, Zurich um, uh, School of Architecture, was already investigating on what are the resources that are to be extracted uh, by, this, by the island state uh, in building its buildings, but also in surviving as an economy. Uh, and so I just wanted to mention a little bit of the two other smaller photographs. And the first one is actually a cave. It's an oil cavern, uh, not a cave. It's a man-made cave uh, to store oil. And is this, and then it's like stored like deep, deep beneath uh, the ground. And it really just shows how Singapore, even in light of land scarcity, uh, is able to, I guess you can say, monetize uh, its land vertically underground. And then the second photograph underneath is actually kind of like, maybe right now it's already illegal, but by then it's okay. Import and transport of sand itself, that is sand largely used for construction, but also for land reclamation. And so you can now understand that this photo being part of the hinterland series speaks of of the idea of how our lands and our and how the city state is actually built and so again back to this photograph of Pulau Tekong, uh basically it's actually a photograph of again the beginning of a reclamation but it had to stop halfway because of territorial dispute between singapore and malaysia because it is cutting or the reclamation itself actually cuts into the waterway of the Johor Straits. And so uh, it was brought up to the International Tribune and it led to a negotiation where Singapore actually had to halt and even cut off certain land uh, that has gone, gone beyond Malaysia. Uh, and in such a way that it actually led to this very weird shape of a nose uh, because of a kind of a corrective surgery. Uh, and so it's that sort of, a, again, you know, um, talking about like why, why are we acquiring this is because, yeah, we are able to kind of tell this kind of a, this force of human, I guess, in, in constructing even something as seemingly natural as islands. Uh, and so now my little challenge of linking the two, uh, not much of a story uh, like 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 eco, but uh, I think I just have to emphasize that um, I guess if we want to summarize it, our interest in architecture today has really broadened uh, beyond the design and construction of a building, but, but the construction of our kind of like landscapes, you know, and it has to do with like infrastructure, landscapes and all that. Um, and so it's not that we lose interest in how a building is designed, uh, but then I think now we are more interested in how the invisible forces behind the building itself. Uh, yeah, so that's the reason why I think those two are linked uh, under the category of architecture. I hope you're convinced, but it's okay. Please bring your questions and disagree. Thank you. Oh, yes, I should change, All right. Thanks, Shirley, um, and thank you, Eco. Um, it's interesting because when we took up this challenge from the Canadian Centre for Architecture, it comes under their recipe book, How to Disturb the Public, and it's looking at how to sort of change up the nature of public programming. And um, we were sort of joking that it was more like how to disturb the curator because we were asking you to do something that you might not normally be thinking of because we kind of use this time those two different time periods to make the selection so it was a bit random in that you didn't know what you were going to get um so i think how you guys managed to link those objects was really fascinating and certainly i hope it gives all of us new insights into how you might think about the collection display um, just for everyone who's watching us, you can actually look up a lot more of these objects on our collection beta, and those four are actually there. So I'll type in the link before we leave tonight. Um, but we have a few questions that have come in from the audience, so why don't I share those with you guys? Um, and I'm going to start with the first one um, to Shirley, because I think it comes from, um, it's sort of a natural jumping off point from what you were just talking about, which is, how, How do you distinguish between architectural photography, photography and fine art photography, photography with architectural elements like Michael Wolff's Architecture of Density series? And we talked a little bit about this before, like what makes that an architecture object versus an artwork photograph? So maybe yeah. do you want to talk a little bit yeah, about I, that? Again, I think there's many square meat. Okay, all good. <laughs> So I think a great question. Um, in fact, I would just, you know, it's uh, I would just say that again, this is my own view. Um, I'm not I'm not a fine art photography kind of a specialist. Eco probably would have other thoughts as well. Um, but I would just say that if there was a distinction, if there was for me, the clearest one is the sense of enigma. Uh, enigma is a kind of like this or that, you know, like kind of like, a, like uncertainty about what it is. That to me is a lot to do with fine art photography. I think. Uh, more than architectural photography. 
architecture photography in some ways is trying to really kind of like, you know, faithfully depict and document the details of a built environment in the building, you know, like the light, shadow, materiality, texture, you know, it's a little bit of that, a lot more the goal, uh, investigating the place. But then for something like Bas Princeton, the reason why the category of architecture photography may not completely fit is because that's not his main goal. He has other, he has other goals as well, uh, which could also lie in the category of fine art photography, which really kind of like raising like multiple meanings or readings of an image uh, that you can't seem to, to grasp. So I thought that would be the difference. Uh, not that either one is better than the other, but I think it just raises different questions. So, um, um, thank, thank you. you. Um, and someone else was asking, how did Baz even get a hold of those images in the first place? So, Somebody asked that? yeah. <laughs> Okay. And I'm curious <laughs> as oh, well. I'm I'm <laughs> yes, okay. All right. Um, so how did Bass got those images? He went on a helicopter, just kidding. Okay. <laughs> no, no. I mean like what I mean is like so of course he did, but I think I would just say that um what he revealed to me, it is part of I, I mentioned the institution called ETH Zurich uh lab, future cities lab in Singapore, and it's a research institution funded by the government to investigate Singapore's relationship with the region. Uh, and so obviously that gives him a lot of resources and connections to be able to, I guess, gain access to like the oil caverns before it began being commercialized. Um, or by, of course, all the other photographs of the aerial view of the island or even the, the land, uh, the sand being imported and transported, that could be something during his travels. But yeah, he has special access. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, okay, Eco, I've got one here that's for you. Um, is the is this the only propaganda kimono in the collection, and are there many in existence today? Uh, in our collection, yes, we have uh, six. Uh... Sorry, technical, I'm mute. Uh, yes, we have a few. Uh, as I remember very correctly, it's uh, six. So we have like a one, even like a children kimono. So it's, uh, so the one I showed you was the oldest one. And then we have like the children one when it comes to the more closer to the second world war. So that the um, technology become different for the, the te uh, kimono printing become much more popular. So there's like, a, you can find a little bit easier like uh, the kimonos from 30s and then 40s. But like uh, from one I show from 1800s, very rare. But I think we have like three kimonos, one obi, the belt, no four, and then even like a furoshiki, it's a textile wrapper too. So we have a yeah, six, seven object related to propaganda textile. Great. And then um, another question, just, um, following up on the kimono. Where did the term propaganda kimono come from, since it wasn't necessarily considered propaganda back then? Well, it's 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 a John, so it's like it's not how we terminology is like just a little bit when we need to search some more the, the research and then the publication and so forth. That's a kind of widely called because it's those type of textiles not only in Japan. So like in the US or in Europe, you can really can find the war motif uh, kimono. So it's so it's not like a yeah, it is like a war textile. That's also another way to call it. But it is like also capturing the the event of the history, but also the kind of patriotic ideas. And then, so even, so it was maybe not like a proper, also we can also question ourselves if propaganda, it has to be come from just, a, you know, the state's message, but it's also kind of, we can be very un, yeah, unconsciously supporting that, but it is like a, yeah, it was just a terminology. Often we use it like a, when we search the wider material. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask you guys one last question. Um, someone asked, said that they would love to hear the curators narrate from a visual art object to a design architecture object. Is that possible? So. Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> that's that's almost like a M plus mission. We have Museum Visual Culture. And then we also like this. Yeah, it's quite the amazing. It's like when we do the acquisition, so we always have already dialogue between visual art team. So it's not like we just discuss what is design architecture and we just acquire own collection. We are actively already finding the connecting um, the links and then even stories, almost like a tagging along the 
you know, there was the previous question of photography in, you know, the art photography or architecture photography. So we are very actively seeking for, and then, yeah, it's definitely in our mind, it's already, it's coexist uh, very much. And then also even when we think about the, the exhibition planning as well. So, yeah, so you will see it partially uh, here and there in our, once the museum is open. Mm. And what do you say? I think, uh, no, just uh, Carrie's question about how do you, how can you narrate visual art and design and architecture together, you said, right? Yeah, so uh, so that's already addressed, uh, mm. Nicole rightly addressed it. We have always considered things as a visual culture as methodology kind of framework. And so I think for us, we are more interested in the meanings, right? In mm. the end, the meanings will always be able to bring out very different works, but to talk about or emphasize a particular story, a particular idea, but in different perspective. And that always, this multiple dimensional view of understanding a phenomenon is very important for us. And that's what the different disciplines can do. Uh, but at the same time, the reason why there is a design and architecture team or there is a visual art or moving image is because we also believe that each uh, discipline has its own histories, audience, ways mm. of production. And we also want to bring out those stories. And and I guess, so So yeah, I think both are important mm. ways, right? Yeah, and then also like, you know, the all, all genre, moving image, art and design, it's it's existing exactly same time and exactly so there is no different size so it is a this is quite naturally uh, yeah we always find the linkage because talking about the same event but just from looking at from different angles mm -hmm. you know so so it is a, like a, yeah we are very interested and it's quite naturally happening mm -hmm. yeah interesting yeah Right. Great. Well, that seems like a good place to leave the, the talk tonight. And the good news is, is we'll be coming back um, and doing a few more of these with our curators from other collections, introducing us to some new pairs. And perhaps we will cross disciplines uh, if it makes sense in the future um, in this online space. Um, so thanks everyone for joining today. This is a this is an initial pilot, so feel free to leave us some feedback if you have some thoughts or if you have any tech issues we want to know so we can um, improve for our future um, talks online. And uh, other than that, I want to thank you for joining us tonight and um, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye.